So my name is Jackie Skoll, and as was said, I do teach writing for the media. I also teach speech, and I have some of my speech students here. I also teach intro to mass comm, communication theory, theory interpersonal, so I've done all that. I also just recently wrote a book that will be out in August, So, and I come from a journalism background, so hopefully what I share with you you can, you can take away as information that will be useful should you go into some kind of career in journalism, should you write news for a news magazine, a newspaper, a website. But the other thing is, even if you don't go into news, this style of writing is really helpful no matter what career you go into, because it's a different style of writing than academic writing. It's not to, it's, its focus is clarity and efficiency. I'm not here to denigrate academic writing, but sometimes academic writing can be a little bit difficult to digest. And the idea in news writing is that it's clear, it's efficient, and points are made as quickly and effectively as possible. So um, I wanted to, since we don't have that much time, I wanted to sort of break this down into structure and style. Structure rever refers to the organizational pattern. And what's really helpful is when you go out and you report a story and you have all this information, if you know how you're going to organize it, it becomes much easier to get your story done and to meet Christian's deadlines. Very often, it's when you have all this information and you don't know where to go with it that you end up missing deadlines. So the inverted pyramid is sort of the tried and true organizational pattern that journalists use to tell a story. And what does an inverted pyramid look like? Well, it looks like an upside down pyramid. What does this mean in terms of how you organize a story? It means that the most important information goes at the top. And as you go paragraph by paragraph by paragraph, you include information in decreasing order of importance. So you go out and cover an event like Game Jam. I'm using that because I just recently read Evan's article on that. Right, so you go cover Game Jam. If someone were to say to Evan, Evan, what's Game Jam all about? How would you answer that? Um, I would begin to tell him what it's about. So tell him what it's about. Oh, uh, so Game Jam is, um, it's pretty much a global, um, event where students or people interested in making games come together for a weekend and they develop a game in 48 hours. Right. Exactly. That's what it is. And that's how he started his story. He didn't begin it by saying, um, going back in history and saying for the last X number of years, Raritan Valley Community College has hosted Game Jam. We have, I'm not sure how many years it has been, but it's been several. And that information, while important, isn't the most important. That would be later in the story. So here's another example. You're doing a story about a town council meeting. Say for some reason, um, Somerset County it has a, a meeting, and they're going to be talking about Raritan Valley Community College. And Christian says, I want you to go out and write a story about this county commissioner's meeting. Well, when you come back, you're not going to tell the story chronologically, because at a city council meeting or a county meeting, it usually begins with um, a welcome, then there's an approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, then there's an agenda, and they follow the agenda. Well, maybe whatever issue he wants covered that has to do with Raritan Valley is the last issue. If you wrote the story chronologically, by the time we got to what 
he's interested in, we'd be at the bottom of the story. So when you're writing a story, the most important question to ask yourself is, so what? What's this story about? What do my readers want to know? That first paragraph is called the lead. Sometimes you will see it spelled like this. The lead paragraph is your first paragraph. It's typically one sentence, no more than 30 to 35 words, and it tells readers what the story is about. One of the things about news writing that is different from academic writing is that paragraphs tend to be very short. They tend to be one to three sentences. And I will, before you leave, I'll hand out um, both a, a handout from the textbook we use in writing for the media, which talks about writing clearly, writing effectively, and I will hand out a checklist um, about the inverted pyramid. And one of the things it does talk about is this idea that paragraphs should be no more than three sentences. In fact, uh, this information, a lot of it is also taken from the textbook that we use. And it says, quote, any paragraph that is more than three sentences is too long. It goes on to say, any paragraph that is three sentences may be too long, which is a very different way of thinking about writing than you do um, in academia. So if you know, yeah, question. Um, how do you think, uh, make it like long with keep, like, keeping it so short, how do you make it like a lengthy article? Like, how do you? That's a like, good question. Yeah. It's not about length. It's about telling the story, letting readers know what your particular story or article is about. Yeah. And just because your paragraphs aren't long doesn't necessarily mean that the story itself won't be long. It might be. It depends on how much infra information there is. Yeah. So it's not about growing your paragraphs. And that's sometimes I think students who come out of English class think very much in terms of quantity of words and meeting lengths. Yeah. And that's not how you should be thinking. You should be thinking more about what is this story all about and what is the most efficient and concise way for me to tell it. Is there an equivalent to like what a thesis would be in English? Yes. So and your thesis sentence is what it's all about, yeah. what, the, what the essay is about. And that's the lead. And that's the lead. Okay. It's what it's about. Um, and again, in most of the stories, I think, and Christian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, many of the stories, if not most, are going to revolve around covering events that go on on campus. And most event stories that you will read in newspapers are all, follow, all follow the inverted pyramid style, or inverted pyramid structure. When you get to idea stories, stories about concepts, that's when sometimes your organizational pattern can become a little bit more complex. But for you guys, for most of the stories you're doing, if you think about all this information you have, and you say to yourself, what's most important? After that, what's most important? What's most important? And very often, what you say in your first paragraph will lead to a question that needs to be answered in your second paragraph. The other thing about the lead is it answers most of the questions that you know, or probably most of you know, um, with regard to what, news where? stories. They a news story has to answer the who, what, where, why, when, how. A lead doesn't necessarily get all of these in there, but the lead gets a lot of them, and it gets what's most important. Again, depending on the story, what global, global game jam was, where it was held, when it was held, were some of the most important. P 
pieces of that lead, what it is. Who was there? That wasn't necessary, necessarily important enough to be in the first paragraph. It was certainly important to be in the story, but not necessarily the first paragraph. So the idea is, you always think to yourself, I had a journalism professor who would say to us, so what? So what about this story, this article, this event that you're writing about? What do I need to know? So what? And that's one way to think about it. We'll talk a little bit more about the inverted pyramid and the lead in a second. Uh, I just want to touch on some of the issues of style, because after I go through all of this, we're going to go through an example that shows sort of the different way you organize news stories from the way that you tell traditional stories. Okay. You all know grammar, punctuation, so important when you are writing for the media because you're writing for an audience. In terms of grammar, anybody know what the most uh, important parts of speech are? Period. That's punctuation, yes. and yes, it's very important. Uh, pronouns. Parts of speech what? Pronouns, like the I. Who. Pronouns? Yeah. Definitely not. Verbs? Verbs, yeah. Uh. Nobody who I've had before? Nope. You shouldn't have answered that. You <laughs> <laughs> should have let somebody answer Verbs, most important. Nouns also. When you have your nouns and your verbs, you can tell a whole story. Many people think that adjectives and adverbs are essential to telling a story, but adjectives and adverbs very often are the clutter or fluff that will get pulled from your story. Here's an example. Coming over here now. Okay. John walked down the hall. Can somebody get John down the hall doing something other than walking? Someone give me a verb. Push. John pushed down the hall? Yeah, it's in the wheelchair or something. Well, then it would be John was pushed. John, John skipped yeah, down the hall? Pushed. Excuse me? John skipped down the hall? We'll take skipped only because was is a to be verb, and was isn't as powerful as, let's take skipped. If John skipped down the hall, what might that say about John? He was happy. He's energetic. He was happy. He He's was, energetic. He was celebrating after an event or something. He was celebrating. Uh, right? This verb can tell you something about this now. What's another verb that could get John down the hall? Run. Ran. He yeah. ran down the hall. What might that tell you about John? Were you in class? He's late. He was in a hurry. He's in a hurry. Impatient. Impatient. People are chasing him too much. Someone's chasing him. He's chasing someone. How else could John get down the hall? Segway skateboard. He could skateboard down the hall. What would that tell you about him? He was athletic. He's a rebel. He's a rebel. He's athletic. He's in a competition of some kind. I don't know. What if he crawled down the hall? Hiding from a shooter or something? He's three years old. He's three, he's on drugs, he's hiding from a shooter. It's a great movie. All of these tell you more about John than walked does. Does that mean that you should never use the verb walked? No. Nope. No, of course you can use the verb walked. But verbs are really important when it comes to writing, because the verb not only is the action of the sentence, but it can tell you about the subject of the sentence also. And in none of these cases did we use adjectives or adverbs, and we were still able to get a little bit more of a sense of who John is. So when you're writing, you really want to think about your verb choice. 
and um, you want to think about your to be verbs. So someone was walking is not as powerful as someone walked. When you add was, was eating a piece of cake. She ate a piece of cake. There's more action to the sentence if you can use one verb rather than a helping verb. So it's something to think about when you're writing. If you go through your story after you've written it and you have lots of was this, was that, was the other thing, then go back and see if you can insert some more active verbs that will help you tell the story. Okay, so punctuation, hugely important. I am going to find somewhere, Christian, I have at home a comma cheat sheet that you can keep in the office. Not that you can't go online to Grammar Girl or one of the many sites to help you. Yeah, figure out where and when you need to use commas. But commas tend to be the punctuation mark that most trip up students. Yeah, my English teacher, Professor Gaffney, said that you have to have two independent clauses on either side of the comma if you want to. It's like each side of the comma should be able to stand on its own as an individual sentence. Exactly. And very often, they don't. commas are put in when you don't have yeah. the two sentences on either side of the and, which is a problem. Or, because the and is there, no commas used. Yes. So commas sometimes get overused, sometimes they get dropped. But if you have a one-page cheat sheet, then that can help you out. Were you going to say something else? Yeah, I know sometimes with English class, and I learned this from Christian, you'll say and, comma, and then whatever else. You, in the newspaper, and you don't use. It's called, what did you say that comma was called? Serial comma, comma or the Oxford, Oxford comma. comma. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's actually that's a good point. Let's talk really quickly about the Oxford comma or serial comma. Okay, so... When you're in elementary school and you're first learning about commas, you're taught that if the sentence is the flag is red, white, and blue, you put a comma between white and the word and. Most newspapers use what's called AP style. The AP stands for the Associated Press, and it's the largest wire service in the world, and it provides news stories for newspapers all over the world. These newspapers pay AP so that they can have reporters internationally. Uh, it's especially important for some of the smaller newspapers that can't afford to have reporters outside their region. So what the AP did many, 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 many decades ago was it decided it needed to have a style manual so that words were spelled a certain way across all AP stories, punctuation was used the same way across all AP stories, capitalization across all AP stories. One of the things the AP decided was that it was going to drop the serial comma for newspaper writing. So, when you are writing for Christian and for the record, I believe you drop the serial comma, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the record abides by AP style. So when I was actually writing my book, I was very used to writing like this. Books and some magazines use the Oxford serial comma because they have a different style manual that they go to. The, called the Chicago Manual of Style. So outside of your writing for Christian and for the record, 
one of the things I tell students to do is either find out whether your professor wants the Oxford col uh, comma used or not, or at least be consistent throughout the entire paper so that if he or she comes to you and says, why are you missing your comma throughout the entire paper, you have a reason. And you can say, I know it's not there. It's a serial comma, and I chose not to use it. But it is important to know. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but, but like a red, white, and blue, like would an Oxford or serial comma only apply when it's like, and is separating two colors or whatnot, or that's it? Yeah, well, in, in, a, um, in a series. That's why I, it, it's known both by the Oxford comma and the serial comma. I often think of it first as a serial comma because it applies to words in a series. Oh. Right. So if your mom told you to pick up, you know, your, if you were using the serial comma and your mom told you to pick up milk, cereal, grapes, and apples. This is the space for that serial comma, that Oxford comma, that either gets used or doesn't use depending on who you're writing for. So it can, it can get a little confusing, which is why I think it's important to understand it and know what it is and then be consistent in whatever it is that you're writing. Advertising very often does not use. Advertising tends to, most of the time, write according to AP style. So it, it all depends. Okay. Um, that's punctuation. Okay. Clarity and efficiency are very much related because the whole idea behind newspaper writing is to get a message across to the reader in the most concise and straightforward way possible. So if you read something and you don't understand it, chances are pretty good that the writer didn't do a good job writing it well. Because if the message were written with clarity, you would understand it. Efficiency means you don't need to use three words when you can use one word. Um, some of you were here in the very beginning of, was it the beginning of last semester, Christian? I came in and we talked about, we did an exercise that looked at how you could say something without using a lot of clutter. And I remember one of the um, examples was he wore a white goatee on his chin. What's the problem with that? Why is that considered not efficient, inefficient writing? Why is it redundant? Okay. Yeah, right. Was there anywhere else that you people wear goatees? Not really goatees. So you could take it off. You can't take off war because then you have he a, a white goatee. Sounds good. Probably not. Yeah. So. And I wouldn't want to take away white. Why wouldn't I want to take away white? It gives you like a. It it tells you he's older. Yeah, it gives you a sense of. Style. It's, it's not redundant. If we just said he wore a goatee, we could all have different images. Someone could have an image of someone with a gray goatee, a black goatee, brown. So the idea of efficiency, and we all do this. Every writer, the greatest writers, when you put something down on your first draft, it's going to be fat. It's going to be filled with clutter. It is. It just is. So that's why you never want to give Christian your first draft. You want to put it all down and then go back over it and see where you can pull out some excess verbiage. Very often, 
it's not a matter of rewriting a sentence like this. It's just a matter of deleting words that you don't need. Something else that Christian wanted me to mention, I think, is you write for the newspaper in third person. So unless, I'm going to assume, Christian, unless you tell someone that you want them to be in the story with the use of I, then the story is written in third person. What if it's a, like a review or an opinion piece? Then you'd write it in first person, wouldn't you? Then you'd have to have a conversation with Christian about that. Sometimes you'll read reviews and they don't say I in them. Sometimes they do. Yeah. But I mean, you can read, if you look at the New York Times book review, in none of those reviews of books. They just talk do, about the book. They talk about the book. This is what the author says. This is what's good about it. This is what's bad about it. And they put it out there as sort of a... This is what so I'm saying, is, even though I'm is, not yeah, saying that. Yeah, this isn't my opinion, sort of. This is bigger than that. Um, but sometimes you need to be in the piece. But that's a very, very special occasion. One of the things that's happening in journalism now is there is a lot more of the reporter putting himself or herself into the piece. But most of the time when that happens, they're very experienced reporters who've gotten to a point in their career where they're not just writing traditional news stories. Sort of like blogging almost. Mm -hmm. um, opinion versus fact, that's the other thing. For the stories that you write, unless of course it's a review, there's no reason for you to insert your opinion. And sometimes inserting an opinion isn't even, is, isn't as blatant as I think X, Y, Z. So for example, if you were to write a story about the Super Bowl and you wrote, wrote you know, this year's Super Bowl, or you know, it was a great game, that's an opinion. And what does that even mean, that it was a great game? It might be a great game to a Pats fan, probably wasn't a great game to a Seattle fan, or maybe for someone who, you know, wasn't really a fan of either, what made it, what, what that person thinks it was great was because it was so close and it wasn't a blowout. So sometimes the idea behind an opinion is you want to make sure that you're not saying anything that people could take different ways. So better to say, you know, the Patriots won, this was the score, it was close throughout the game, this is what happened, and then everybody understands. Did you have a question again? Yeah, uh, so I just had a, like I'm working on a story for the rain garden right now that the school built, and just like, just for an example, like if I were to say, um, it's the most important uh, going green feature that Raritan Valley currently has. That's would be qualified as an opinion, according to what you're saying, because somebody could think the solar panels are the most important, or somebody could think that the basement center is the most important green feature. So right. you really and you don't want to say that. Now, if the president of the college says it, and it's in quotes, that's OK, because that's his else. opinion yes. about it. But for you to say that, unless you had a whole host of facts to back it up, yeah. Well, I mean, you can I put one of in front of it, one of the most important, or one of the greatest mm -hmm. games of football ever played. Like, would that give you a little that, bit more credibility? That would give you more credibility than you have to follow it. Because then you're, you're, when, you, when you say it's one of the greatest games, you're probably relying on fact versus saying it was a great game. Yeah. Which could mean different things to different people. Other questions? I thought I saw someone. Yeah. Okay, so here's my question. If I asked you to tell me the story of Little Red Riding Hood, what, how, does it, how does the story go? Who once can upon tell me this time. one? What? Once upon a time. Okay, once upon a time, then what? Yeah, just go run in the woods. 
Then what? Bring her grandma cookies or something. Mm -hmm. And then a wolf comes and murders her. <laughs> I don't remember the rest of the story. Okay, well, you, you, you kind of jumped, but yeah, the... She goes she, to Grandma's house. She goes to Grandma's house. Finds the wolf in oh, yeah, bed. Right, the wolf bed. went in first. And doesn't the, realize it's the wolf at first. Exactly. Right, so what happens is that is your traditional way of telling the story. But now, let's say you are a reporter and you live in fairy tale land and the editor of Fairy Tale News says there were deaths reported at Granny's house. The, well, Tell I the, the title Murder in the Woods. What well, was the murder in the woods? No, it was in the house. Yeah. Well, yeah, but isn't the house in the woods? <laughs> it's <All right>. <laughs> okay, maybe if the house was in the woods, but okay. let's get past the headline. Just murder in like Just, yeah. 120 Okay. What's the lead? Local girl. Local girl uh, killed by wolf masquerading as grandmother. Okay. No sick homicidal wolf dressed as innocent grandmother. A wolf dressed sick homicidal. Yeah. Probably not. No. Not unless you're the. Uh, not unless you're a psychiatrist and you. Not unless you're the Daily News. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> no. No, but the point is, right, traditionally we very often tell stories in a linear fashion how the event unfolded. Try to find the local angle of it. And so for, yes, you try to find the local angle, but you want to, what is important for readers to know? Not that Little Red Riding Hood started out from her own house at 10 a.m. and went through the woods. What people need to know is that Grandma and Little Red were murdered by a wolf. Where did it happen? When did it happen? How did it happen? So right. usually chop off the bottom of your article when they're editing, right? Wait. They usually chop off the bottom of your article when they're editing, right? Possibly. That's a, what Ben's getting at is the, the original reason for the inverted pyramid of course, it was developed long before there were computers when there were printing presses. And if the printer had the paper laid out, and then let's say it's all set to go for the next day, and now there's a fire at City Hall. Obviously, that story needs to make it into the paper. Well, what were they going to do to find room? Well, they couldn't go back Pick up and time. edit all of the different stories. What they could do, because everything was written in the inverted pyramid, was just lop off the bottom of several stories because this was the least important information. Sometimes it was adding a little bit more context. Sometimes it was, re if it's a story that's been going on for days, maybe it was repeating some information from prior stories. But the idea was you could just lop it off. And the reader would still understand the story. So how many of you have ever read a story in a newspaper or on a website, and you're reading, reading, and you feel like, I got it, I understand, I don't need to read anymore. Right? Yeah. That often happens. Well, that's because it's very likely the story's written in the inverted pyramid. You took from it what you wanted, what you needed in terms of information, and you didn't feel like you needed the rest, either here nor there. Um, so what I wanted to be able to leave you with today were a couple of things. So this inverted pyramid checklist is, I'm going to send it around. That's the one thing I like about the Wall Street Journal, is they're not afraid to over print a lengthy article. Pass these back, please. Pass these back. So essentially what this will do, when you write your story, you can pick this up and say, okay, my lead, it's the focal point of the news story, one sentence, 30 to 35 words maximum. Did I do that? If you have four sentences in your lead, you probably have too much. You probably have information that's important for the story, but not necessarily important for the lead. The second paragraph should expand on or develop the idea that you put forth in the lead. One. Th um, habit that sometimes new writers tend to do is they will give a great 
first paragraph. So here, um, here's an example of the Little Red Riding Hood. A girl and her grandmother are alive today despite being eaten by a wolf Saturday afternoon, a spokesman for the Peralta Police Department said. A student in one of my previous classes um, did this as an assignment. So, oh my God, you can say, how could she be alive if she was, or how could they be alive if they were eaten by a wolf? So you want to keep reading. If he had then gone and said, the incident began Sunday morning when Little Red left her home to go visit Grandma, then you would have a lead on top of a chronological telling of the story. So what he did was he said, the incident occurred at 333 Arnie Thompson Boulevard shortly before 5 p.m. According to the grandmother, Red Grimm, she was lying in bed when the wolf broke into her house and entered her bedroom. Okay, now I have a little bit more of an understanding of how she ended up being eaten. Then, a quote from Grandma. I didn't know what to do, Grimm said. The sight of him was so horrifying, I couldn't move. Before I knew it, he swallowed me whole. I can still remember the smell of his insides. Well, quotes are really helpful to telling a story because they often add the color to a story or they flesh out a point that you as the writer perhaps can't make because you weren't there. So in this case, the quote by the grandmother gives a really good picture of what happened to her. So you know it in the traditional sense, but this is written in, a, in the inverted pyramid. This sheet also talks a little bit about attribution, which is telling your reader where your information came from. So again, in this case, some of it came from the police, some of it came from the grandmother, some of it will come from Little Red Riding Hood herself. But it's really important to let your readers know where your information comes from. It also has a few um, suggestions to check for common mistakes when writing, pronoun and pronouns being used correctly. So when sometimes people write, everyone ate their lunch, what's the problem with that sentence? Everyone ate their lunch? Anybody know? Probably means there and everyone. Because you don't need to say everyone and there. You can just say everyone ate lunch. OK, you could get rid of that. Yeah. But you're, you're on to something more when you tie the everyone to the there. Who is everyone? Is that your question? Well, every, no, my, my point is that this everyone is singular. It has to be lunches, right? Well, okay, so at each person has his or her own lunch. So lunches doesn't solve the bigger problem that the noun and the pronoun, one singular, one's plural. And that's a common, so that's a common mistake that writers make, so that's on there just to help you. Commas are on here, comma splices. Reminder that your paragraph should be short. Reminder about clutter. And reminder to make transitions between paragraphs. Okay. This that I'm gonna give you has suggestions for what the textbook we use calls clear and effective writing. It talks about using short words instead of long ones. The idea is when you're writing, you're not writing to show off how smart you are. You're writing to get a message across to your readers. It talks about the absolute importance to revise. It talks about, hello. Uh, it gives a really good suggestion about reading your story out loud. 
a really good uh, suggestion to read your story out loud once you've revised it because it will help you hear it says how it will sound to the reader plus it makes it easier for you to either catch grammar mistakes or if as you're reading it out loud you stumble then chances are the writing isn't as clear as it could be if it makes you stumble over it so that's just and then this is There's something I, actually it's not on here, but I read somewhere else that when you're done with something, another way to find errors is to read it from the bottom up because it's not the way you would traditionally read something. So if you read something from the bottom to the top, you're more likely to catch punctuation or grammar, grammar errors than you would if you're reading something for the 15th time from top to bottom. 